Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Back Row on Air Sport. Another massive weekend ahead as Leinster and Munster chase a place in the final of the Heineken Champions Cup. I'm joined in studio tonight by Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times and Keen Tracy of the Irish Independent to look ahead to both games. Very welcome along, guys. Thanks for coming in on what is no doubt a busy week for all of us. Jerry, we're left with 12 titles between the four clubs in the competition. It feels like we're down to the, the best four in the comp. Yeah, it does, not it? Pedigree counts in this competition, doesn't it? Like, in uh, every year, you get the four quarterfinal winners of 12 titles between them, the four quarterfinal losers only had one title between them. No coincidence. You even look at a club like Ajax last night in the Champions League, making it through the semi-finals, breaking that stranglehold of the major leagues. Why? Because it's in their DNA. It goes back to Cruyff and Marinus Mikel for the titles they've won. And I've been to Ajax, and you go through all the, you know, all the posters in the walls of the trophy being held aloft. And it's the same for these four clubs. It's in their DNA. I know it's been a while since Munster were there, but I think I'm right in saying and Conor Murray, Keith Earls and Peter Armani were all in the crowd as kids in 2006, the Millennium Stadium. So they've grown up with this Munster-Heineken Cup relationship as well. And it, and it just counts. I think it's part of the reason, all part of the reason the four teams that pulled through in the quarterfinals did. And it's set up two mouth-watering ties. And you know that whoever gets the final will have deserved it. Yeah, love the football reference. You know you were playing five-a-side earlier on today. Keen, two Irish provinces left. And after a really disappointing Six Nations, it's a bit of optimism there, isn't it? Yeah, it's very much needed. I think you look at the four teams in the Pro 14 playoffs, you're going to have the four, the four Irish provinces in the Champions Cup next year, which is huge. Obviously, Connacht had the massive result last week, which was season-defining, but also, I think, next season-defining as well. But yeah, that down to Leinster and Munster now to fly the flag in Europe, um, the two heavyweights, and like Jerry said, it's going to be whoever gets the final will certainly have earned it. Yeah, well, let's start with the, the defending champions on Sunday against Toulouse in Dublin, Jerry. <laughs> Interesting enough, there's quite a negative narrative around Leinster at the moment. You were there speaking to, to Stuart Lancaster this week. Do you feel it's warranted or are people just reflecting on the last couple of results? No, I don't feel it's warranted at all. Um, if you look at what Leinster have done, they're back in the semi-finals. They're the leading try scores and point scores in the pool stages. They racked up big bonus point wins in all three pool home games. And I think even the fact that the way they came through against Ulster, when Ulster threw the kitchen sink at them, will stand to them in the semi-final. Often a tight quarter-final, is, you're, it, it benefits a team more than if you have a very comfortable quarter-final win. Um, and I think... Um, Leinster, like, they were outstanding against Wasps and outstanding against Toulouse in January as well when they completely starved them of possession until about Cheslin Coldbay danced through in about the 79th minute. But that was a convincing Leinster win again and they'll be locked and fully loaded. The only caveat to all of that is that I think Toulouse are more dangerous than they were in January for a variety of reasons. They kind of built that game up as if, as if like, oh, this is our real asset test, even though they've been on a lawn and beaten one at home. Took it on the chin, bounced back with six straight wins in a row in the top 14. The way they... The way they came back from being 10-7 down and a man down and out half down after 20 minutes against Racing shows you that this is a team that, pardon the pun, has forgotten to, how to lose. And they're, they're going to be more dangerous with the weather forecast, sun on their backs, everything else. It's going to be a different game. Yeah, another great win against Claremont in the top 14 last weekend. <clears throat> we'll come, come back to Toulouse, Keane, but I just guess on Leinster, a lot of the negativity probably is around Johnny Sexton in particular as well, the key guy and a guy who hasn't played a lot of rugby at all. What do you expect from him if, as expected, he comes back into the team? Yeah, it's, it's amazing to think that Johnny Sexton hasn't played for Leinster in 2019 and his last game was that you know almost infamous game down in Toma Park when he had the run-in with Finian Witcherly. So yeah, he, he's got a, a lot to prove this week. Um, he, he was coming good, I think, towards the end of the Six Nations. Okay, the Wales game didn't go you know the way Ireland wanted, but that old saying, class is permanent. Um, this is a big stage. This is where the big players come. Even if you look at someone like Sean O'Brien, I feel like it's a big game for him as well. I know, Jerry, both of us were talking to him last week ahead of the mm. Glasgow game, and he was kind of saying that, you know, there was much more to come from him. I don't think we quite saw it in the Glasgow game, but with Dan Levy and Josh van der Fleer out, Stuart Lancaster was saying there's even more of an onus. And he's another guy who's a big player. Doesn't really have, he doesn't have anything left to prove before he leaves Leinster, but... He needs to finish, I think, on a high, um, especially rolling into the World Cup where he's going to have a massive role to play as well. Mm. I'd agree. They'll both have big games. And Deb Tone and Robbie Henshaw being back in the mix is huge for them as well. Felt they went well last weekend? Did they look... Yeah, I mean, they're rusty, but they'll benefit from that. I thought Shawnee actually grew into the game for that 20 minutes at the end of the first half and started the second half before he's taken off. And as for Johnny Sexton, he's had many a long layoff and come back and hit the ground running, to use that cliche. Like, you think of that 10-week um, layoff or concussion and he came back his first game for Ireland was outstanding at Lansdowne Road. I'd have no. I'd say he must be itching for a game as well, and uh, he's a leader for them. They've got a lot of experience, and experience counts 
in the semi-final stages. Yeah, Lancaster talking about that, that as well. Um, and it will be interesting to see how, how Johnny Sexton comes into that. I guess in terms of team selection, as always, you're talking mm -hmm. about that three into two situation. Mm -hmm. Fardy, James Lowe, who just would be crazy if he misses out, and Jamson gives the park. How do you see that one going this week, Keen, given the other... Because it's always depending on what, what else they have in the team. Yeah, I suppose th this will be one of the last big games they'll have to do it because obviously James and Gibson Park will become Irish qualified. I think it's in June or July. Um, I, I think maybe it comes a little bit more straightforward this week. I think the injuries to Ross Maloney, it looks like he won't play again this season. And Mick Kearney, who actually has been playing really well mm -hmm. in the last few weeks, makes it that Scott Fardy has to play. I think James Lowe, they were saying, was battling with a bit of a shoulder injury. This is the game. This is the game. I think that's made for him. We saw it in the Champions Cup in the earlier rounds. How good he was. He's a game breaker. I think against a team like Toulouse, you're going to need something like that. The scrum half situation. J Jameson Gibson Park was obviously on the bench for the Ulster game, but Luke McGrath was still working his way back to full fitness, and I feel like he's there now. He got more minutes um, since then. So yeah, you're looking at that, and even Nick McCarthy, I don't think is. Um, is registered for the Champions Cup, which is interesting. He's obviously moving on to Munster next season, which would mean Hugh O'Sullivan in that case, if we're going to pick Fardy and um, James Lowe, would mean Hugh O'Sullivan, who's very inexperienced. But Leinster and, and Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster have proven all the time that reputations don't count for much. They're, they're back in these young players. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's James Lowe and uh, Scott Fardy. Mm. I think it might, I think Lowe might miss out myself. Kim. You think so? Yeah, I think they really value the impact Jameson Gibson Park can give a game mm. twenty minutes, thirty minutes from the end off the bench, and it's very important to have that in the modern game. Toulouse, we certainly know, will have it no matter what combination they go with. Sebastian Bezzi, who's a fine player, just Anton Dupont is almost world class. We don't think of him as a really fine player, but he showed that again in the wrestling game. They'll switch up, and I think Leinster really value what Gibson Park can give them off the bench with about twenty or thirty. Yeah, to go. it'd just be such a shame not to have yeah, James Lowe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'd be amazing to have not James Lowe and have two guys who are going to be on the bench because I think we'd all agree that Devon Toner and James Ryan are going to play so to leave yeah. James Lowe out mm -hmm. for two subs in my mind would be would be crazy they have a couple of options in back three really don't they, they? a lot of guys who, who've kind of come back into form how would you see that going then Jerry if Lowe doesn't feature because Rob um, Carney's place I guess has been in question as well yeah this. but he had a very good return last week and finally breached the try line and then along came a second one mm. so I wouldn't be surprised if it's him and his brother or Adam Byrne like they did in the in the quarter final, and of course you've got Jordan Larmer there as well. So they've got and Dave Kern, they've got they've got options in the back three, more options in the back three than maybe they do have off the bench at scrum half. Yeah, we said we come back to Toulouse. They've been so yeah. resurgent this season. It's been a pleasure to watch. Eight points clear in the top fourteen after yep. that win over Clermont. Let's dig out some of the reasons maybe why they're having this resurgence. It hasn't just happened all of a sudden, has it? No, um, a lot of it's down to Reggie Son and the work that Clement Potrino does behind the scenes as well and upgrading their skills. They were, spent a season out of the European Cup and used the Challenge Cup to blood a lot of their young players. And they've got a lot of young, homegrown players coming through. Partly, um, necessity being the mother of invention, they, they, they don't have the financial clout of the, the, ones, of the other clubs backed by multi-millionaires. So they had to start going back to producing their own kind of players. Um, and they've got this nice amalgam now where they bring in like Jerome Kino and Charlie Firmino. So they've got the big carriers up front. Then you look at their backline, it must be the smallest backline in the tournament. Yeah. And it's all full of footwork and it's appreciation of space and transitioning from defence to attack, which I believe they work a lot on on the training ground. And just the way they keep the ball alive out of the hand, the offloading game, their angles of running. And it's so much talent to choose from and so much good footwork, whether it's Guitan or, you know, Uge or yeah, Dupont is just ridiculously good how he is. I mean, I think he scored five tries in the last five games of the tournament. Mm -hmm. You can think back to the first two rounds when he was coming back from injury and he came on against Bath and Leinster at out half and transformed both games. He shifts to out half against Rass in the quarterfinal and scores a try as he had done at scrum half. Remarkable talent and a real danger around the, uh, around the rock. Yeah. Nancy are going to have to starve them and frustrate them. Yeah, Dupont loves a good strip in the tack as well for mm. a small guy. He's very yeah. good in that way. Just on, on Reggie Son, um, he's obviously a good banded mm. man. What, what does he bring to the mix? He's an enigmatic sort of character, isn't he? Yeah, like I think when he rocked up to Bandon, you know, they couldn't believe their luck that they got a guy of this calibre. You know, he wanted to sort of take a break from the limelight and the offers that he had to, to remain in the game said a lot. And I think if you look at the resurgence of West Cork rugby, you've seen the likes of the Coombs cousins, Finian Witcherly, um, Josh Witcherly, who just won another 20s Grand yeah. Slam. It's no coincidence that he's helped these guys come true. But in terms of what he's brought to Toulouse, it was interesting. We were chatting to Richie Gray earlier this week, and he was saying he's helped bring the age back to the, the pack, you know, that mm. he's very strict. Um, 
that it, maybe in French rugby it's very kind of laissez-faire, but he drills them, he drills that pack. And like Jerry said, Charlie Famuina and Jerome Kaino, they have that nice mix of, you know, and Gray himself as well, of players who aren't French, but they're adding to the to the environment, which I think is crucial. So, yeah, that was the thing. I think he, he's brought that little bit of edge and it hasn't been as loose maybe in... OK, Toulouse still have the tendency to turn around a bit, but they do have that edge that maybe was missing in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think they're 100% on scrum and mm -hmm. their mole, obviously, using some of that bulk they have up front is really good. One of the other smaller guys in the back line, Jerry, is Chesn Colby, who you mentioned, who has been just a pleasure to watch, particularly because he's a small guy in a game where we thought it was going to be all 110 kg backs now. His footwork is just extraordinary. He got <laughs> yeah. one glimmer of a chance in the RDS and he was through, like a knife through butter. He falls over and, and on the ground and still gets up to his feet and dances through three or four guys. He's also quite strong. His footwork is ridiculous. He could just beat any amount of players. Um, he's lethal and it's, it's good to see small guys like this, you know, who can cause untold damage at that level of the game. And he's a real go-to man for them. He's lethal off counter-attack and turnover. You know, he's just, again, he's another one who sees space. And he's, if, if it's any way loose and open, he's going he's gonna to cause Leinster problems. Yeah. It, it, it's in the blood, though. Like, he's, he's cousins with Wade Van Niekirk, the South African sprinter. So, mm. you know, it didn't fall off a tree. Like, there's yeah. definitely in the blood there. Fast twitch. I, I'd give anything for a couple of those fibres. <laughs> but just in terms of how this game is going to look, the counter-attack is key. They're the top offloaders in the comp. Leinster, however, have the fewest number of turnovers. So you would say that's in their, in their benefit. What's the blueprint for, for Cullen and Lancaster? Toulouse, they concede points, they score a lot, but they concede points. And I think what they'll give you in attack, I think we can't understate how important it is to have Robbie Henshaw back. I thought he looked very good for the hour that he was on the pitch. I was at that game last week, a bit rusty, but I don't think Leinster's line speed has maybe been where it usually is. And I actually thought Ireland missed him as well in the centre. I know he obviously played a full back for the England game. So I think the line speed is key. You've got to get up in, in these guys' faces because, like Jerry said, the likes of Colby, even Thomas Ramos and Gitan is sensational. Mm. You, and he showed that footwork actually in mm. Toulouse as well, didn't he? Like you talk about Jordan Larmer stepping people in a phone box, but they have so many guys who could do it. So I think the line speed is going to be absolutely crucial. And having Robbie Henshaw back will be, will be essential to that. And also, obviously, the set piece, Devin Toner, he just brings that calmness, doesn't he? Like you see his importance when he's not playing. And while Fardy is a great um, player to come in, Devon Toner is the one guy you want there running the lineup, does isn't he? Yeah, Jerry, your favourite ref, Wayne Barnes, in charge of this one. How do you think this game is going to look? Just to, just to wrap us up here. <laughs> um, I think Leinster have to do to lose what they did in January, a bit like what Ireland did to France as well. Just starve them, frustrate them, be really accurate in possession, which they weren't in the first game in Toulouse. Ultimately, to lose one because of Leinster mistakes. If Leinster don't make mistakes and they retain possession like they can, like they normally do, they'll win this game. Yeah, should be a fascinating one. Well, after the break, we'll preview Munster's Crunch semi final with Saracens at the Rico Arena. Well, you're very welcome back, Keen. Obviously, a really interesting fixture on Saturday in Coventry. Munster face Saracens and their eight point underdogs. It's going to be a big ask, but. I was down there on Monday and there seemed to be quite confidence amongst the group. Peter Romani talking about them being a different animal in his own words. Where do you think that confidence, I guess, from Munster is coming from? I suppose if you go back to the 2017 semi-final, you know, they didn't really fire a shot. Um, that was the biggest disappointing thing about that day. Saracens were probably even a better team than they were back then, but Munster just didn't fire a shot. I was sort of thinking back to that day and what everything, what was going on around it. Conor Murray obviously didn't play, which was massive, mm. but... You remember all the doubts about Razi Rasmus's future and he came into the press conference afterwards and he was saying, oh, I'm not going anywhere. And Niall Scannell came in and he said, oh, the coaching staff have reassured us. And it, behind the scenes, it just it didn't all add up. And then obviously a few months later, he's out the door. So Munster were in a strange place, even though on the pitch, it seemed that they were going a good time. Two years later, I think they're in a much stronger position. Um, Defensively, they've been outstanding. Um, OK, they've lost the last, what is it, six, their last six semi-finals. But I think JP Ferreira has done a really good job, a really sort of unassuming character. We don't get to speak to him much or ever mm. in the press, but I think he's been really good because when Erasmus left, they also lost Jack Nienarber, who was an incredible defensive coach, and they, they tried to get him to stay as well, which said, said so much about how, how do they valued him. But I think they are a different team, but... It, now is the time to prove they are a different team. It's all well and good saying it. They have more weapons in their arsenal. There's no doubt about it. Um, Ty Byrne just gives them so much. It gives them an all together different threat. Okay, Joey Carberry's missing, but Tyler Blaine all is in a good place. And I think Chris Farrell is big as well. Mm. I think having him 
in the back line this weekend is going to add a little bit more of a dynamic. I think two years ago it was Rory Scannell and Yako Taude, but I think Chris Farrell has the ability to unlock this defence because while he has the power game, he also has the passing game. And if Munster can get their back three who are so dangerous into the game, I think they'll have a chance. Yeah, we saw that lovely catch pass from Farrell mm. for the, the Earls winning try mm. against Edinburgh. Jerry, do you, would you go along with it? They're a better team this time last year. You think of that Racing semi final and they were really poor in Bordeaux. Um, just didn't really feature at all, but there are new faces and certainly seem more confident. Well, they were even worse two years ago against Saracens. They played in a tactical straitjacket that day and they were missing Conor Murray and they got beaten up a bit and uh, they were very one-dimensional and Tyler Blaindale's game came apart a bit. This uh, Last year I thought against Racing, I really thought they were going to win. And I don't subscribe to the theory that there's this glass ceiling above them because they'd won three of the four previous pool matches over the previous two seasons against Racing and could have won the fourth over there. They just didn't turn up. Just, and I've asked Munster players for the last year what the hell happened to them, and they can't explain it to me either. Maybe it was something to do with that South African trip that just took the legs out of them a little bit. They were caught cold to start. There was no line speed in defence. There was soakage. They were missing tackles. Even Conor Murray himself missed one. I think roll on a year, you're right about their defence. Much more line speed. Mm more comfortable in their spacing. You look at the defensive work they went through in that quarter-final against Edinburgh, this is a different team defensively, and offensively I agree with you as well. I think, you know, they didn't, they didn't have Conor Murray two years ago. They didn't, last year they didn't have Farrell or Tyke Byrne. I just think they're, I think that was misleading last year. I think they are really due a big, big performance. There's no way they're just not going to turn off to the third semi-final in three years. I think they're in a good place and they'll have a big performance. And they can take a lot of comfort from the fact that they've played Exeter, who are leading the Premiership, and Gloucester, who are third, and were unbeaten in four games against them. That yeah. wouldn't tell you there's a glass ceiling that Saracens are way ahead of them or anything like that. Saracens are very good, but Munster have a big chance here. Yeah, really interesting. Sorry. Yeah, and I think the, the 2017 game, we were asking Mark McCall about it during the week, and he was saying, oh, it's dangerous to look too far back. But... I think this is a good good game for Munster to look back on because for 40 minutes they stayed with them and it's it's easy to forget now but I think it was only 6-3 six, three. Six, three mm. at half time and they you know they probably thought okay Munster probably thought okay we, we've done well the game plan is going according to plan but you can imagine Saracens just rubbing their hands together going we have you right where we want you now now we're going to turn it on in the second half and that's what they can't do this week because the exact same thing will happen Munster have to be brave here they're, like we said their defence is good but they're going to have to fire a shot I think at this to, to, uh, sorry, Saracens team if they're going to have any hope Glendale was excellent two seasons ago all the way up to that semi-final yeah. we forget that as well you listen to all the Munster players have spoken about him since the quarter-final and the calmness he mm. brings the sense of organisation he brings he was excellent in that quarter-final that second half when you think of the long penalty to touch Catching the line out that went over the top yeah. and then nailing that touchline conversion. Sport's funny, isn't it? Maybe mm. the forgotten man now, two years on, has redemption against the same opponents in the same stage of the same tournament. And I think at Munster deserve a lot of credit here because they've stuck by him by two career threatening injuries. Mm. You know, yeah. when you think about it, he, he suffered the first one just after he signed and I'm sure there was probably a clause in the contract that would have said, OK, we might back out in this. But they recognised then what, what kind of talent they had in their hands. And I think now... He obviously has missed so much action because he had a recurrence of the neck injury that could have finished him. But they gave him a new contract. And like you said, that is a massive show of fate to a guy. And like you said, he's starting to repay it now. And I think he'll be all the better for the game two years ago as well. He's one of those players, he seems to have time on the ball. Um, like real Kiwi sort of thing. Like mm. I know he's always compared to Dan Carter, but he does seem to have that extra little split second in his vision. But he doesn't take it as much of the line as Joey, though, no, either, does no, he? No, he's, he's, he plays a little deeper, but yeah. he's going to have the likes of Brad Barrett and Billy Villapola running mm -hmm. at him this week. And while he's, he hasn't shirked any of his defensive responsibilities since he's come back, which has been, I think, amazing for, you know, you think about how sensitive your neck is and how important it is to you, but this is going to be a different piece, isn't it, against two of the biggest yeah. biggest guys. Yeah. It's good that Conor Murray played so well in the quarterfinal as well and, and felt so good about himself physically after the game mm. and came up with that big play in the lead-up to the Keith Earls try. Yeah. Well, Jerry, on, on the Saracens front, a bit of a... Mm. Storm around them with Billy yeah. Vunapola. Obviously, I know you wrote about it this week. You were speaking to Mark McCall. Does that put a? Uh, I don't know. Is that is that a difficult build up for them? Yeah, they've got the Billy Vunapola thing getting booed last weekend and having to come out with <coughs> statements about the issue this week. They also have um, a Premiership rugby inquiry into possible breaches of salary cap. They're going to the Rico Arena. Munster are going to have more fans than them. Do you know what? It makes me worried because this is a classic Saracens plot line, isn't it? Us against the world. They're like the Millwall Football Club. Sorry for another football analogy. But, you know, it's us <laughs> against the world. And they revel in this. 
they'll circle the wagons and I think it actually might make them stronger at the weekend. And they're still a class team when you look through their team sheet, you look through their performances this season. They're the leading try scorers now in the competition. I mean, what they did to Glasgow despite losing Owen Farrell in the morning of the game, the possibility of Marco Vunapolo being back as well, Brad Barrett being back as well. You almost forget Liam Williams is there, you know what I mean? And Alex Good could switch from fullback to out half the last day. Now he goes back. One of the most underrated players probably in the scene in a different time might have had a ton of caps. Uh, and then Sean Maitland, a really good player as well. So they, they, Jamie George, we mentioned earlier, is probably one of the star players of the tournament. Is just come on to another level this season. Um, his skill set is passing mm -hmm. in open plays, like an auxiliary back, and he carries well. And their line is fantastic. I think it was 31 throws in a row there in the quarterfinal of the game before. So you add it all together, and it's a real... It, if Munster are to win this, it's going to be one of their great wins. Yeah. Just on Vila do you go along with that? That would feed into Tassari's producing a big performance? Yeah, I, like, I'm not sure about him being booed. I'm, I'm not, like, it'll be interesting to see how that happens, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how much of an effect it'll have. But for me, I don't think the weekend's action can come soon enough because it's been so disappointing that the agenda has been dominated by something like this in what is the biggest week of the season for the clubs. We were three of us actually were speaking to Mark McCall, and you know he he refuses to talk about it. And rugby holds itself to values, you know, and the culture. And this was a good time, I think, to you know stand up. And, and I'm not saying make an example of Billy Vunapola because it wasn't the same as what Israel Falau did, but it was a good it was a good chance to stand up and say this isn't what we stand for, this isn't what we're about. But not refusing to answer questions was a bit rich. And then an hour later, they released a statement. And yeah. I know Jamie George, it was the same thing that he wouldn't answer any questions either. But I don't think you can have it both ways. If rugby is going to stand itself up to certain values, I think you're going to have to come out and make a point of this as well. But in terms of Vili Budapola, I'm not sure it will affect his performance. Yeah. yeah. And we're on to the rugby now, Jerry. I mean, we gave a, a blueprint for Leinster. What's it going to look like from Munster at point of view? You mentioned all those incredible strengths from Saris, and mm -hmm. they've got that rugby league influence in, in their play. What do Munster need to do to win? Well, I think their defence has been excellent this season. I think they're the best defensive record in both the Pro 14 and in Europe. Um, they're going to have to produce a, another outstanding defensive effort, first and foremost. Really good line speed, get up in their faces, stop Vunapolo and the other big carriers from rumbling over the game line, stop Vunapolo from freeing his hands. You know, he, he can be negated. Ireland have done it to England in the past with him. So I think that's first, that's the building block, a really, really strong defence, maintain that good spacing that they have. Um, and I don't think they'll be wild and carefree in possession or anything like it. I think that Blayendal there maybe might even suit a kind of a, a cup semi-final, if you like, a month of playing cup rugby, but with that little bit of variety as well, whether they, they take their chances like they did in Murrayfield with that Keith Earls try. Um, so I think, yeah, and build a bit of scoreboard pressure as well if they can. I wouldn't like to see Munster have to chase the game. Yeah. I wouldn't like to see, mm. see them two scores behind, Murray. Yeah, in terms of those attacking touches, Keane, do you feel that... They've progressed enough that that evolution is complete and they're, and they're ready to fire a few shots? I definitely don't think it's complete at all. I think they're, they, they still have a, a way to go, but it feels like the defence is where they want to be. But I think they have the players there to do it. They just have to be a little bit, a little bit braver maybe than what they have been. Even if you go back to the Edinburgh game, you look at Keith Earls' try. When they turn it on, they're well able to do it. It's about picking your right moments. And if you go through the team, there's a lot of these lads are in the form of their careers. You look at Dave Kilcoyne has never played better rugby. Mm. Ty Byrne has been brilliant. Um, Niall Scannell, Jean Klein, I'm not going to go through the yeah, whole team, yeah, yeah. but you, you know what yeah. I'm saying. I think Conor Murray has actually been excellent in his last few games, even against Cardiff in the Pro 14. Peter um, Manny's having a fantastic Peter Manny, season. Peter yeah. Um, Chris Farrell, like I mentioned. And then you, you did the back three, Keith Earls, again, is just, just getting better yeah, with yeah. age. So it has to happen for Munster You're like, mm. you know these guys are in the form of their life I think if they're a little if they're braver than what they have been they've shown throughout the Pro 14 and they showed against Edinburgh like I said for that Keith Earls try which was sensational yeah. that they have the firepower to do it it's just about picking the moments yeah. to do it well it sounds optimistic I'll get you to, to call that one are Munster going to do it? As the, as the week goes on I'm Getting confident would not be the right word, but I'm getting more hopeful, I think. Um, is it eight points you mentioned? that, that That's a lot to me, especially in a semi-final. As, I, I, as it goes on, I think Munster might sneak in. I agree with Jerry that they're due yeah. a big performance. Six finals, six semi-finals in a row is yeah. just yeah. not in their DNA. It's now or never. Jerry, mm. in a word, Munster? I, I, I started with Saracen at the, the beginning of the week, so I'm going to stick with them on the basis that you look through all the Heineken Cups in history and the best side invariably wins it. And the best two sides in the competition possibly are Leinster and Saracens yeah, with yeah. the best two out-halves. And you always have a world-class out-half and a Heineken Cup winning side as well. 
But like Keen, the nearer it gets, the more I think this might be doable. And maybe this Munster Leinster first final is going to sneak up on us this weekend. Yeah, you think Leinster gets through as well? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah that Leinster time. definitely. That'll yeah. be good fun, guys. Thanks, million. Well, don't forget that the Air Sport Pack is the only place where you can see both games this weekend. Saracens against Munster is live this Saturday on BT Sport 2, with coverage getting underway at 2:15 p.m. And on Sunday, reigning champions Leinster host Toulouse at the Aviva. That game is also on BT Sport 2 from 2:30 p.m. My thanks to Jerry and to Keen and to you at home for watching. Good night and we'll talk to you again soon.